People exist in a sacrificial relationship to the world. What does that mean? It seems to mean something like human beings are aware of their extended self. You know you're going to be around tomorrow and next week and next month and next year and five years from now and 10 years from now. Now, it's less certain as you go out, but you do have the sense of yourself as something that stretches across the decades. Okay, and so what that means is that you have to conduct yourself in a manner that isn't merely immediate. You have to conduct yourself in a manner that will work across time. Now, how do people do that? They work. Work is a sacrificial gesture. So you work by definition, virtually. Work is the sacrifice of the present for the future. I mean, maybe someone can come up with a better definition of work than that, but I don't think so. It's like you, you put in time and effort right now, even if it's something not what you'd like to be doing at the moment, you put in time and effort because you believe, what the hell does that mean? You believe it'll pay off. Well, is that a contract with the future? Is it a covenant? Because the relationship that the biblical corpus characterizes human striving is covenantal. It's a bargain. The bargain is you make the right sacrifices and they pay off. That's the bargain. Now, you might say, well, that's just part of the social contract, but the biblical corpus insists that it's deeper than that. It's built into the structure of reality itself. And that if you got the sacrifices right, the future would be paradisal. Well, that's a kind of sacrifice right there, is that you're willing to sacrifice your short-term physiological and psychological comfort for a medium to long-term benefit. It's the essence of sacrifice. This is something the atheists don't understand about the biblical narrative, is that the narrative insists that we live in a sacrificial relationship. It's the essence of humanity to live in a sacrificial relationship. It's like, well, is that true or not? Well, as you mature, your relationships are more sacrificial. It's less about what you, in your narrow sense, want right now, and it's more about what's good over the medium to long run, including other people. Well, that's a sacrificial relationship. Now, the covenant, you know, and this is a matter of faith. It's the matter of the deepest faith. Are you willing to act out the proposition that the way to make the world reveal itself to you in its most positive guise is for you to adopt the most appropriate sacrificial relationship? Well, it's a big risk, isn't it? Because you have to give up everything. That's the, that's the deal. You give up everything that's low. Everything. Everything. Well, that's what the Christian passion is, because the Christian passion is an archetypal story, because Christ is the person who sacrifices everything everything thoroughly 100% there's no indecision because you age like you pay for your indecision it's a decision it's a decision to avoid fundamentally you no know, and part of the moral that's embedded in the story of job and in the christian passion is that you can master what you'll face and maybe that's true I mean, the clinical literature seems to indicate that it's true because one of the things you do if you're a competent clinician is you look at what people are attempting to accomplish and maybe that needs some retooling, but let's assume that they have a goal in mind that would work, right? You've talked it through with them strategically. They have a well laid out vision. Okay, now they're laying out the vision and they encounter impediments that stop them and maybe they're impediments that make them afraid and paralyze them. And so then what you do is you decompose the impediment until you find a way they can advance that constitutes a genuine advance that they'll actually do. So what you do is you take the problem and you narrow it until they'll face it. Okay, then they face it. Then what happens? They get more competent. That's what happens. And then they get better at facing all problems. So they don't just learn how to deal with that specific problem. They learn a lesson that generalizes across problems. They get braver. When you use exposure therapy, people don't get less afraid. They get braver. And that's way better because mm. braver, braver moves from situation to situation. Okay, so the question is, if you faced everything that was put in front of you, who would you be? Well, the answer, the biblical answer is you'd be a true son of God. That's the biblical answer. It's like, well, do you believe that? Well, it depends on what you mean by believe. Do you have a better bet than facing what's there? Well, you just have to be sensible about it for a moment. It's like, is your theory that you're going to adapt better using falsehood and avoidance? Because that's the contrary theory. You either face it and you do that predicated on the faith that something in you will respond if you do, 
or you don't face it. That's it. Those are the options. If you don't face it, that's faith too. That's faith in the notion that avoidance and deception will suffice. There's technically two different forms of reward. There's consumatory reward. That's what an orgasm is. It's consumatory reward. It brings the behavioral and perceptual sequence to a halt. It ends it, right? At the climax, it ends it. But then it's over. That journey is over, right? Then there's the dopaminergic reward. And dopaminergic reward is evidence of advancement towards a goal, right? Okay, so, so there's a corollary to that. Well, how do you become optimally engaged? Because dopamine facilitates engagement and focus, which is why drugs like amphetamines can be used for kids who are attention deficit disordered. You tap up the dopamine response, they lock on, right? Okay, so they're locking on to a goal-directed pursuit. The problem with amphetamines is that they can lock you on so hard you can't get out of the frame. So like kids on amphetamines will obsess, for example, about cleaning up their closet. They can't switch to the next activity. Okay, dopaminergic reward is reward that's accrued in relationship to a goal. Okay, so what's an implication of that? Well, pursue the highest possible goal. Well, why? Because the kick from advancement is higher. Now, you have to balance that. It can't be, you have to advance, right? Because imagine the reward's got two components. Number one is you're moving towards something valuable. Okay, so you want it to be as valuable as possible. Okay, but you have to be moving. You need something extremely valuable that you can move towards. Okay, so part of the reason that you establish a relationship with God, let's say, is because that's what sets the upper bound to your vision. It's like, I want things to be the best they could be. That's a vision of paradise. Well, that has to be fractionated into, you know, your proximal decisions. But lurking behind that should be this continual movement towards, what would you say, a heaven that recedes as you approach it. That's the proper vision of heaven. A heaven is a place that's perfect and getting better both at the same time. That's what music shows you because a great piece of music is perfect, but it's just getting better as it unfolds. And, and you need that. This is part of the problem with a static utopian vision, something Dostoevsky criticized. If you gave people nothing but consumatory reward, he famously says, so that they can do nothing but sit in tubs of hot water, eat cake and busy themselves with the continuation of the species. Human beings would break that all to hell in a moment just so they have something interesting to do. If you run yourself through a disciplinary process, so you accomplish something, maybe you don't attain the goal you were aiming at, but you accrue a new way of looking at the world and a set of skills. Well, if you just keep doing that, you have multiple ways of looking at the world and more and more skill. Well, that's, that's your storehouse of treasure. As you walk through life in your normal mode, things will call to you. And if you pursue them, they will take you deep. It doesn't really matter what it is that calls. What matters is that you pursue it and you, you pursue it to the depths. And as you pursue it to the depths, you will become transformed. And if you do that without reservation, that will turn you into the person who frees the slaves and opposes the tyrants. And that is how it works. That's the call. And that can happen in any direction, virtually any direction. You just have to pursue it with sufficient faith. Aimless is not nothing. Aimless is bad. Nietzsche said if you had a, a why, you could bear any how. Most people find the meaning in their life through responsibility. I believe the, the fundamental religious truth of the idea that life is suffering. It's suffering because we're mortal and fragile and because we're also subject to malevolence at our own hands and to the, at, at the hands of others. It's a, it's a constant existential problem. And that can make you bitter and can make you hopeless and nihilistic and depressed and anxious and, pro, and likely to abuse uh, substances of various sorts as, as a medication or an escape. It, it can auger you in, in, in a very large number of ways. And I'm suggesting to people that there is a way out of that and the way out is to confront that forthrightly and to adopt responsibility in your own life and to try to make the world a better place and that it's necessary to do that. And that if you don't do that, that things go badly. I think the deck is stacked against everyone to some degree because life is very difficult and we all die. So, but people, some people do have it harder than others. And, and all of us have it very hard at some times in our lives. It's like, well, what's the, 
what's the alternative? You take responsibility for that and try to struggle uphill because the alternative makes everything worse. Find something in your life that's so worthwhile doing that the fact that you're going to suffer is justifiable. Yeah, life's rough, no doubt about it. And if good luck comes your way, then you should be grateful for it. And if happiness manages to manifest itself, you should be grateful for that too. So then you might ask yourself, well, what's the best antidote to the discomfort of life? And you might say, well, it's comfort. And I suppose that's what you act out when you swaddle a baby. But a better antidote is something like adventure to excellence. And that's far better antidote to suffering than the mere absence of suffering. So not to say that the mere absence of suffering, that's not nothing. I've been a psychotherapist for 20 years. I've seen things you can't imagine, horror shows that you can't fathom, and people who have been hurt in so many ways, so many dimensions. It's like, should they be bitter? Should they be resentful? Should they become violent? These things don't help. They have to struggle uphill despite their excess burden. And it's, it's responsibility, not guilt. It's the female crucifixion. That's so, and, and that's exemplified best in, well, the best portrayal of that I've seen is Michelangelo's Pieta. You know, it's, it's a statue of Mary, uh, and she has Christ's body on her, as an adult, on her lap, and yep. he's broken and destroyed, and, you know, she's displaying that. And that's, that's the bravery of a mother to allow that to happen, but not only that, to, to facilitate it. Facilitate it. Where you go, kid? Where you go? Where you go? Well, why? It's dangerous out there. It's like, yeah, no kidding. More dangerous here if you stay with me by a lot. So you might lose your body out there in the world, but if you stay here, you lose your soul. <laughs>